The morning of September the 30th, 2009, has become part of Baton Rouge folklore. Some say an army of SUVs descended on Keaty Drive, a quiet street in suburban Louisiana. Well, there may have been one or two SUVs, but I can promise you, FBI agents don't all get assigned black SUVs. That a hundred FBI agents swarmed the lawn. Maybe 15 or 20. It certainly was not a hundred. And that the whole neighborhood came out, some carting their own lawn chairs. One neighbor said he could have sold tickets. I do not know if I sold any of the neighbors lounging around in lounge, lawn chairs in front of their house, but I do now remember seeing neighbors come out. I think I was the one that actually knocked on the toy's door. Mrs. Toy was the first person to come to the door. I introduced myself, told her we have a search warrant to search the house. Where's Mr. Toy? And I remember her turning around and, and, and calling up the stairs, Bill! Bill. This wasn't the first time authorities knocked on William and Beryl Toy's front door. Forty years earlier, William Toy was caught red-handed forging the works of famous Louisiana painter Clementine Hunter. The exact same crime he was accused of that September morning. He got away with it four decades ago, would this time be any different? Hi, I'm Ben Lewis. Welcome to Art Bust, scandalous stories of the art world. I've been writing and making films about art for over 20 years. The art world isn't just high culture, big money and creative genius. In this series, we uncover the ugliest crimes, the biggest scandals, and the murky in between. And today's story? Well, it's about theft. Theft of identity as much as it is about forging art. Clementine Hunter it was this epic human being. It's about a prolific Louisiana artist. She was a black woman back in that time where you didn't have any type of rights. And she went out and she made a life for herself. And the white man who profited off her work for decades. He was the classic con man. William was, um, I, you know, I, even as a novelist, I could not have made the guy up. So who was William Toy? William could not tell the truth. He just couldn't tell the truth. If if it was raining outside and you said, how's the weather looking, Bill? You know, oh man, it's, it's sunny, you know? He couldn't help it. John Ed Bradley is a Louisiana writer and journalist. Usually he profiles famous sports figures. In most stories, when you do an interview, you're pretty well satisfied that for the most part, the interview subject um, acted in good faith and provided you with the truth. But in the case of the toys, you couldn't make that assumption. And if you did, you were doomed. After the raid on the toys' house, John wrote about William for a magazine called Garden and Gun. I think I just showed up at William's house, knocked on the door, a face appeared upstairs in a window, and it was it was toy. He said, go away. You know, and I said, well, why don't you talk to me? And that's how it started. It was easily the most fascinating story I've ever worked on. And I've done a lot of writing, but they were um, mysterious and weird and challenging, very difficult people but they were just fascinating, especially William. 
What John noticed right away was how much William loved cats. William and Beryl told him that over the years they'd had 106 of them. As opera aficionados, they'd named some of their pets after characters in Gilbert and Sullivan operas, until they ran out of names. And portraits of their dead cats were on the walls, painted by William. You see, he didn't just do forgeries. And um, the house smelled horrible. It smelled of cat urine, mainly. You know, you wade into a sea of cats. There were well over 25 cats in the house. Over the course of about two years, John got to know William, this hunched-over 78-year-old man who walked with a cane and could spin a good yarn. He sort of looked um, professorial, like he might have taught, you know, psychology at, at the local junior college. William would regale John for hours with over-the-top tales from his past. But when John tried to verify his stories, they never checked out. Like the one William told him about moving to New York and becoming a symphony conductor of great renown. He would stand in front of me and conduct an orchestra. And, of course, the, no, there was no orchestra there. There was no music playing. But in his mind, he was hearing the music. He had a little baton, and he was doing his thing. And, and he would do that for 45 minutes. And I'd just sit there like a fool and watch him. He told John that he'd earned a doctorate in music, directed orchestras at the New York Met, and mingled with a who's who of Manhattan artists of the 1950s. He said he, he was friends with Jackson Pollock, the uh, abstract expressionist. He said that one time he was with Pollock in his studio and Pollock didn't forewarn him about paint flying all over the place and that he got paint all over his pants. <laughs> he told me this story and I said, well, Pollock... He wasn't in the city doing that kind of painting. He was out on Long Island somewhere. And he said, no, he says, no, I, I, I saw it. It was in the city. When he told me these stories, I would let him ramble on. And I would smile. And sometimes I would laugh because I, I knew it was horse shit. Apparently, he uh, worked for a time for, um, for an architect or an engineer doing sketches. But I don't know if that's true. I could never corroborate it. He... He just lied so much. There were a few things John was able to corroborate, like the fact that William was born in New Orleans, Louisiana, in the 1930s, and that he didn't make it past the 11th grade. Despite the lies, John and William developed a friendship of sorts. I felt like there was a cult of toy for a while. I think there were a number of us who were writing about the toys who couldn't get enough. It, they were our drug. Over time, John grew sympathetic. He saw how the toys were struggling financially, how sometimes they didn't have enough to eat. Sometimes he didn't look well, and I'd ask him if he was hungry. You know, I, I'd say, let's go to the store. I'll buy, you, I'll buy you a buggy full of food. William didn't just paint dead cats and fakes. There were also toy originals, paintings he did of New Orleans. And in an effort to help the couple financially, John bought a few. They were magnificent. These weren't fakes with fake names on them. I mean, they were signed William Toy. They were William Toy originals, and they were great. William once told John he might have had a chance to make it as an artist if he were able to function better in the real world. Apparently, he battled agoraphobia, and for a time had a crippling fear of leaving his home. The work might have been good, the stories entertaining, but there was a dark side to William that made being friends with him very difficult. He could be incredibly cruel. He, he had nothing good to say about anybody. He hated everybody. He, it, he, he just was constantly um, saying ugly things about people. 
William eventually turned on John too, when John stopped helping him financially. I'm not a rich guy, and um, it was a strain on my marriage. My, my wife would get upset, and I would bring home another toy, and I'd put it in the attic. You know, he was calling me all the time, but he started calling me later and later at night. And he, he started to threaten my daughter. He would say that he knew where I lived, he knew my schedule, and that I'd better be at the bus stop early if I wanted to make sure she got home safely. And, you know, and I said, what the hell are you doing? Are you, you you're threatening me now? I've, I've been good to you. That ended it for us. I'm pretty sure that he was a sociopath. You know, he didn't seem to have, except for the cats, he didn't express warmth for any living thing. We don't know exactly when the forgery started, or why, or even how William got so good at them. William told John that in his spare time he taught himself to paint. He studied art books and began creating very decent copies of French Impressionists. He could fake Monet. He could fake Renoir. He could fake Gauguin. At one point in the 1990s, he faked a Matisse and a Dega. He almost got away with it too. The toys tried to sell them at a Baton Rouge auction house with a combined price tag of close to half a million dollars. But experts questioned their authenticity and wondered why works by such big names were being sold at such a small-time operation. Despite the controversy, William never admitted he'd forged the paintings. In true toy style, William spun a crazy story that involved international drug dealers targeting auction houses, stealing original paintings and switching them with fakes. So the toys were victims too. Over the years, William's said to have conjured up other schemes to make money, including bankruptcy scams. And of course, there were the Clementine Hunter forgeries. In the early 2000s, Clementine Hunter's fame was on the rise. Her fans included Oprah and Joan Rivers, who owned some of her work, work that was selling for thousands of dollars. At the time, her paintings were flooding the Louisiana art market. Today, we know that many of those paintings were actually William Toy forgeries. These forgeries got ubiquitous. They went everywhere. He was a machine that really produced art. Tom Whitehead is a longtime friend of Clementine Hunter and the president of the Cane River Art Corporation, a non-profit that holds the copyright to Clementine's work. He'd heard of fakes in Louisiana, New York, Missouri, Texas, and Washington, D.C. I was in Washington doing some business, and they had a waiting room, so I go in the waiting room and I look on the wall, and there are Clementine fakes. I just nearly had a meltdown. At the time, a lot of people got caught up in William Toy's forgeries. Even Tom got duped. He was approached by a well-known dealer in Louisiana named Robbie Lucky. Robbie had an antique store, and he also sold art and stuff like that in there. Well, uh, he called me one day and said, I have some Clementines I've got from a person in New Orleans that wants to sell them, and they're just really great. Robbie bragged about having access to Hunter paintings from an elderly woman who wanted to get rid of her massive collection. Well, I actually bought two or three of them, and a friend of mine, uh, an attorney here in town, and his wife bought two or three or four from him. Tom says he spent about $9,000, but he did eventually figure it all out, thanks in part to a Christmas tree. Several people I know said to Robbie, Robbie, Tommy Whitehead has this great Christmas tree by Clementine. Tom got this particular painting from Clementine years ago. If you can ever find 
a Christmas tree. In fact, I'd like to get three. I have three grown kids. I like to get, be able to give each one of them a Christmas tree. Robbie said, well, let, give me some time. These are hard to get. But he said, I'll go look for them. And three months later, Robbie calls my friend and says, I found three more Christmas trees. This find rubbed Tom the wrong way. He knew Clementine painted only a handful of Christmas trees, and now Robbie Lucky had three more? So, Tom gave the hunter paintings he bought from Lucky a closer look. That's when he noticed things weren't right. There were no smears, no pencil marks. She always propped the board up or held it in her lap. She would take a pencil, mark it, and then paint it. Clementine Hunter painted in slow-drying oil, so there were often little smudges, sometimes even her own fingerprints. But these paintings Tom got from Lucky were too clean, like they'd been painted on an easel. Tom also noticed there were multiple scenes playing out on one canvas. Clementine might explore one subject in any given painting, but two or three? That wasn't her style. I was gullible, I guess. I didn't go through the test completely because they were nice-looking paintings. There are good forgeries and bad forgeries, and this was a good forgery. I'm Kareem Maddox, and I've been playing basketball since I was four years old. This year, I'm training for the Tokyo Olympics and wondering what it means to be an Olympian. We didn't want to be used as some sort of political tool. And what the Olympics mean to all of us. If one of us can win a goal, then it will mean a lot to the people all over the world. Because the Olympics have always been about more than just sports. I do think that I achieved my greatness here. Subscribe to The Greatness with Kareem Maddox. That's me. Produced by USG Audio and Transmitter Media. It was sometime, I first got involved with the case sometime in 2008, I believe in the summertime. FBI agent Randolph J. Deaton IV, better known as Randy, had never investigated an art crime before. He spent his career taking down money launderers. But one day in June 2008, he got called into his boss's office. And he said, Randy, I've got a case I want you to work and only you to work. And I said, well, why me? He says, because you're the only agent I know that watches Antiques Roadshow. That's a true story. William Toy had been on the radar of various authorities for decades now, but many were unable or unwilling to do anything to stop him. Deaton's job was to finally bring William Toy to justice. William and his accomplice, Robbie Lucky, swindled buyers out of nearly a million dollars. There was one family that invested their kids' college tuition into the forgeries. A former school teacher bought her fakes with her retirement fund. So Deaton dug in. He rifled through William's past, looking for clues. He sent suspected fakes to a lab and discovered they weren't decades old, but fairly new. And he interviewed more than 25 alleged victims, who, through their own investigative work, found out that the elderly woman who hired Lucky to sell her hunter collection was none other than Beryl Toy, William's wife. I think it was a Monday morning, and uh, the phone rang. And I answered the phone. Randy Deaton says, guess what I'm doing? I don't remember if I called Mr. Whitehead that day. I know I was on the phone a lot that day calling various people. I said, well, I don't know. What are you doing? He said, I'm herding cats. I said, herding cats? It was hot and sticky that September morning in 2009, the day the FBI raided the toy home. I was the one that knocked on the toy's door. It was 
in total disarray. There were five gallon buckets full of used cat litter. Uh, there was a an awful foul stench to the house. It was quite the day, with all the neighbors watching, and animal control coming to deal with all the cats. A neighbor next door said he saw Beryl Toy rolled out on a stretcher. Meanwhile, Deaton and his team of 15 worked their way through the house, moving from room to room, fending off cats. We were looking for artist supplies, Clementine Hunter-like artwork, document evidence. But Deaton knew he also had to talk to William, away from the chaos of the house, away from Beryl Toy, and away from the Louisiana heat. So Deaton coaxed William to the back seat of his car, a chance to cool off with some AC. And it must have been I gained Mr. Toy's trust that day and I was listening to him and I was asking him questions and I was giving him the attention that he may have craved all these years. And I don't know if he told me the whole truth, nothing but the truth, but uh, he told me a lot of things that I knew were truthful uh, from me conducting the investigation. But William still managed to tell a few lies. He initially told me that it was his wife, Mrs. Toy, that had created the Hunter forgeries. And then later on, he took that statement back and said, no, it was actually him. He was the forger of the Clementine Hunter forgeries. After five hours on Keaty Drive, Deaton had a confession. The FBI also found an art forger's toolbox and five hunter paintings in the toy home. And when they were inspected under a microscope, those five paintings revealed a key piece of evidence. The telltale sign of a toy, a toy forgery is if you can see cat hair sticking up out of the paint. I never dreamed that cat hair would become an important aspect of an FBI investigation, but it certainly was in a toy case. The case against William Toy went to court in 2011, and through it all, journalist John Ed Bradley says William maintained his innocence, even though he confessed on the day of the raid at the back of Deaton's car. He claimed to be innocent, and he said that Beryl had, um, years before, been a friend of Clementine Hunter's, and that she made quite a few trips, and over time had amassed a, a collection of 400 paintings. He um, needed her to survive. He was totally dependent on Clementine Hunter to pay his cat bills, to put milk in his bowl of cereal. But he he just grew to have this resentment, this rage toward her. He, he could get really ugly. Ugly and very racist. He said her, her art was, was an art. He called her the N-word. And I said, hey, man, I don't want to hear that shit anymore. Don't say that. And he said, you know, he says, well, she's all, you know, she's terrible. And they're claiming I would make forgeries of her work, and it, he, it was this great insult to him. Despite his insistence on being innocent, William Toy pled guilty to conspiracy to commit mail fraud. And so did Beryl Toy. And Robbie Lucky, the art dealer who sold William's forgeries, pled guilty to mail fraud, was sentenced to 25 months in federal prison and had to pay $327,000 in restitution. The toys were sentenced to two years probation. The judge also ordered that William pay $426,000 in restitution to 23 victims. And to avoid any further mix-ups, the judge said William had to sign his forgeries. He was happy to do it, to tell you the truth. I think, again, one more opportunity where the spotlight was kind of on him. On the way out of the courthouse, William gave a final performance. Tom Whitehead remembers it vividly. 
all of a sudden we hear whoa and we look up and Mr. Toy has taken his walking cane, opened the door and tried to hit the New York Times photographer taking his picture. And the photographer walked in and said, he tried to hit me. <laughs> William Toy died in 2018. He's reportedly buried in an unmarked grave in Louisiana. I don't know. I, I look back on that period with um, awe, just pure awe, that such a person existed. Yeah, you, you know, I, I'm telling you, you can't, you can't make him up. He, he's just, he was a force of nature, and not a good one. He was Hurricane Toy, and um, he just swept through our little part of the world and 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 wreaked havoc. and And he hurt a lot of people. He's a white man, and he uh, stole from a, a black lady who had worked for much of her life as a cook in a plantation house and he ripped her off. And I think by the basic definition of that term, cultural appropriation, yes, he's, he's guilty of that. Clementine Hunter isn't the only historic black artist to be forged. She's joined by painters like Alma Thomas, Bob Thompson, and Jacob Lawrence. Artists who mainly because of their race were overlooked and or undervalued by the art establishment, making them easier targets for enterprising fraudsters. So, um, you know, if there, if there is an afterlife, Clementine Hunter has not encountered William Toy. They went to different places. She was, to me, an untouchable, where he was this really pathetic guy who, in the end, got what he deserved. Unfortunately, Clementine never got to see William brought to justice. She died over two decades earlier, in 1988. She was 101 and painted almost till the end of her life. Remember I told you that separating fact from fiction when it comes to Clementine's life was hard? Well, that's still true. After her death, Clementine's work and influence continued to grow. Her fans would travel to Melrose Plantation, the place where Clementine started to paint. You could take guided tours of the so-called Big House and the African House. We went to the um, Big House, the, the Melrose Plantation. We went there, and at that time we went in to tour, and it was a mural that she has in the um, African House. But just like everyone else, members of Clementine's family had to pay for a tour when they visited decades ago. It's not a good feeling to have to pay to go see something that you grew up in and that you visited regularly. According to Sharon Banks, Clementine's great-granddaughter, being charged admission wasn't the worst of it. We almost got put out because everything that the tourist guide was saying, my mom was in the background, that's not true. Or my aunt was chiming in. She ain't do that. So <laughs> we almost got put out. So um, we didn't go back <laughs> after that. Because it's, it's kind of um, humiliating to know that they can do whatever they want and um, say whatever they want, display whatever they want, and you can't say anything. You have no rights to it because you're not a part. But Clementine's family feel it's more than her legacy they've been kept out of. The Cane River Art Corporation was not involved in the Melrose Plantation tours until recently. In 2018, they worked with Melrose to renovate Clementine's old home. Now her home is a part of the guided tour of the plantation. The Cane River Art Corporation was put in place by friends and collectors who dedicate their time to run it pro bono. 
back when she was alive, we uh, realized that uh, her copyright was not protected. And that was this was an issue, some of the forgeries and stuff. They set it up with Clementine to help curb the forgeries of her work. The Cane River Art Corporation now holds copyright. Tom Whitehead sits as president. I feel I'm honoring her. I'm going to go away and nobody's going to ever know me again. They'll know Clementine. I hope to keep that spirit and name known and her art recognized. But it's messy. The family says they talked to Clementine about copyright at some point in her life. She said no at the time. But when a few friends and benefactors asked her about copyright, she said yes, and they set up the Cane River Art Corporation a few years before her death. Willie Mae Jefferson, Clementine's granddaughter, and Sharon Banks, Clementine's great-granddaughter, said they didn't know about the deal Clementine signed with the Cane River Art Corporation till now. And while they agree it's important that her work is protected, like with that Melrose Plantation tour they took decades ago, they wish they were involved. And Sharon wonders if a family member can sit on the board of the Cane River Art Corporation and have some type of input. We uh, never get recognized. It's like she doesn't have any family. While Clementine's family feels in one regard that they aren't part of her legacy, there are moments when it's clear that they are. My oldest one, uh, her name is Terranisha, and she was in the third grade. And she came home one day all excited, and she was like, guess who I saw in the book today? And I'm like, what are you talking about? She's saying the history book, Mama. Mama T-Bay in the history book. Sharon says they called Clementine T-Bay. It means tiny baby in Creole. And I was like, she in the history book and she showed it to me. I was like, oh my God. And she said, I told them kids that was my great great grandmother. And they laughed at me and said, yeah, right. And my mama, Beyonce. So she was kind of upset. And it made us mad. So we sent all kinds of stuff back to the school to prove she's not lying. She is a descendant of Clementine Hunter. <laughs> On the next Art Bust, Scandalous Stories of the Art World. The first of two episodes on the ties that bind colonialism and present-day collecting. And a basement museum in rural Indiana hiding a horrific secret. Enough human remains to piece together 500 people. That's all we were, was dinosaur bones to the guy. No, but to us, those are people. This episode was produced by Alexis Green and me. Our senior producer is Debbie Pacheco. Mix and sound design by Philip Wilson. Consulting by Nanaba Duncan. Our executive producers are Kathleen Goldhar, Katrina Onstad, Stuart Cox and Jago Lee. Our USG audio team includes Jessica Grimshaw, Josh Block, Jennifer Sears and Daniel Welsh. I'm your host, Ben Lewis. This is an Antica Productions podcast in collaboration with USG Audio. For more information, go to usgaudio.com. <laughs>